the fact that the panel, the expert panel is still going on, it really speaks to the fact that how difficult things are right now, how difficult it was to uh, concentrate on, on putting together this presentation um, in the middle of, uh, you know, COVID-19 and coronavirus. This was in, in preparing for this, it was, uh, it was a, a pleasure to be looking at information on uh, treating substance abuse and pregnancy. Um, and it was, uh, I didn't, if you told me two months ago that I'd be wistfully looking at the opioid uh, pandemic and, and wishing that we could be focusing on that again, I would not have believed you, but here we are. And um, I think it's important as we're seeing preliminary data on how black and brown communities are being affected uh, disproportionately by coronavirus that we do not um, take our eyes off the prize in terms of all of these other elements that affect our vulnerable population. So women with substance use disorders definitely falls under that. And um, it's really, really good that we can um, talk about that today and that we continue looking at health disparities and how to improve access to care to this patient population. So I'm going to start with a little bit of um, some demographics and, um, and just kind of go over the overlay, which I think most of us know very well. Um, but it was, um, this is the most recent data that we have from a, a national level, and it was the, the data that we presented in the beginning, I think is really important and would be good to go back to as, as we discuss further. But this is the most recent stuff that we have nationally. And, and um, between 2008 and 2012, about one in three women, women of reproductive age filled an opioid prescription. Um, that's important because we know that um, there's a, a study that came out for the, the MMWR through the CDC, it was Shaw et al. in 2017. And they talked about the, they looked at initial prescriptions for opioid naive non-cancer patients. And they looked at a good uh, a time span, 2006 to 2015. And what happens is after three days of a prescription of an opioid, the likelihood of a chronic, developing chronic uh, opioid use disorder increases over time. So with every day that a person is prescribed more opioids, they're more likely to remain hooked on those opioids. And I think one of the things that we've been looking at and we're seeing downtrends has been really an awareness of how opioid prescribing um, results in opioid addiction. Um, interestingly enough, right? So um, looking at opioid use disorder at delivery, and again, this is something that we, um, the Florida, the data that you sh uh, shared from Florida Medicaid was really important. Um, with this, we're really just seeing that between 1999 and 2014, there was a dramatic increase in the number of uh, women who had an, a diagnosis of opioid use disorder at delivery. And so that translates to um, neonatal abstinence syndrome, that translates to issues with the, um, with hospital lengths of hospital stays and all of these other problems that we're having. So as we're, we were, we've been dealing with an opioid um, pandemic or epidemic actually, um, we were also dealing with neonatal abstinence syndrome as a, a major issue that needed to, that needs to be addressed and prevented. So our program that we're gonna be talking about today, the Mothers in Recovery Program, was really focused on reducing the rates of uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome in our community. Um, something that's important about an NAS is that it isn't just um, the birth outcomes, and, and there are birth outcomes and what happens when the you know, baby's born and, and what we're doing to treat the baby. But there's also associations with long-term issues across the lifespan. So um, we know that um, there's longer hospital stays associated with NAS, but what we, other studies have also shown that there's readmissions of throughout childhood, the increased rate, the, the chances of a child being readmitted uh, because of NAS is um, being born with NAS, sorry, when a child is born with NAS, um, there's an increased likelihood that they will need to be readmitted to the hospital, higher readmission rates throughout their childhood. And the reasons for those readmissions um, are disproportionately related to childhood maltreatment and uh, behavioral health issues. So, um, you know, this is something that 
there's obviously multifactorial. There could be um, issues with adverse childhood experiences associated with NAS, uh, parental bonding, parental education, social determinants of health. But the more that we can start to engage the woman while she's pregnant in a comprehensive program, the better those outcomes are going to be. Um, and Alberto's going to talk about this a little bit more. So, uh yeah. I just wanted to say, I didn't get a chance to say uh, good morning to everybody. Um, and, I, and that's my opportunity to speak. But one of the interesting things is that uh, prior to uh, this presentation, I was actually uh, out sick for approximately two weeks with COVID like symptoms. So to say that this has uh, had a huge impact on us it, um, is, is just an understatement. Um, and, I, and I know uh, Dr. Vicenzo started off by talking about the impacts, uh, but truly, uh, our patients, and we, we talk about this now uh, in lieu of COVID, um, before we had issues with access to care, uh, imagine now, uh, I myself had to go to the emergency department and just the way to get access, uh, the challenges I faced navigating the system. So I think with all that in light, uh, we're seeing a, a new a new ball game now. But, it, but in light of uh, what we're discussing, NAS, um, Marie made a great discussion point on, on rates of NAS. A slight decrease uh, related to Florida, um, but looking at national data, national numbers, um, whenever we discuss impacts of these type of programs, NAS is a huge financial burden on our healthcare system. Looking at Medi Medicaid data uh, from, from 2004 to 2014, we saw average costs of approximately $19,000 in 16.6 days associated with those NAS admissions versus an average hospital stay for those not, not uh, being diagnosed with NASA 3.5 and 3,700 respectively. So we know it's costly. Uh, we know that the, uh, the impact on our NICU days is significant. So all that put, it, put together uh, tells you that uh, number one, is there an opportunity to reduce rates of NAS? Um, and is there an opportunity to have an impact on healthcare related costs? Next slide, Claudia. A little bit more on some of the NAS figures, and this uh, really brings it home when it comes to the different areas. Uh, so these are the areas that we know uh, which have uh, data available related to the incidence rates of, uh, of NAS over 2012 and 2013 in these 25 different states. And you can see the shading in some of these areas are, are well known for related to the opioid epidemic, areas of Ohio, Kentucky, Florida, some of the areas of the Northeast. Uh, which correlates obviously uh, with individuals with opioid use disorders and those individuals giving birth to babies, substance exposed, and then eventually developing NAS. Now the chart in front of you is specific to Florida. And it, I find this interesting. It, it looked at on the left-hand side, you see um, neonatal abstinence counts and rates by county, 2014 to 2016. And if you look at the, the the actual circles, the blue circles, it tells you the NAS counts. Um, and then if you follow by the shade coloring, the yellow being the lighter, all the way up to the, the darker red, and you see the areas and the counties that are being significantly impacted. Um, some areas of the West Coast, and you see the Northeast Coast, and some throughout throughout the state. Interestingly, Broward County may have, uh, where Broward County has a, a larger blue circle, because of the large population size, uh, the shading is that yellowish color. Now, and, and if you look at the, the, next, uh, the next figure of the Florida map, is it specific related to opioid crisis debt? So we know, uh, we know we've had a serious issue related to the opioid epidemic, and we know that the, uh, the rates related to opioid debt are significant. We know these different counties. So we have uh, Palm Beach, Broward, even Dade, and then you see, you see this spread out throughout the different areas of the state. Uh, very high correlation, obviously, with the rates of NAS. So it just brings home the picture of the different areas and different counties that have been affected by the opioid epidemic as well. So um, how did we get here? We've had uh, uh, evidence-based treatment for uh, opioid use disorder and pregnancy since the 70s which is method on maintenance. And yet, you know, we know that as a, as a country, we've gone through periods of, um, you know, skyrocketing rates of opioid use disorder. Um, so when we were tasked, uh, our program really came out of what was happening in Broward County in, um, in 2014. 
there was a, a facility that did uh, treatment for pregnant women with opioid use disorders. And um, there was like a 30 day inpatient hospital program that used methadone. When that program closed, there was nowhere in the community for a pregnant woman to go who needed treatment. Um, and we were approached by the managing entity for the uh, substance abuse and mental health uh, funding and Department of Children and Families in Broward County. And they asked us as a hospital system, could we develop a, a, a way to treat these women? And at the time, and this was 2014, late 2014, they wanted us to completely detox um, because in order for us to make this work, we were in partnership with a residential program that worked with pregnant women. And that program did not allow uh, for anyone to be on any controlled substances, um, opioid replacement therapy included. So. Um, Look, going back and as we developed the program, it was important that we kind of looked at historically what had been done, what was the research and why, um, you know, we, we had to form, we had a couple of issues that we had to look at. One was maintenance versus detox. The other one was buprenorphine versus methadone. So as we designed the program, there was a sort of a push for us to look at methadone and consider methadone as a treatment um, as, a, as what we were going to use. Uh, in the end, we ended up working with uh, buprenorphine instead, and we're going to go into program design and why, why that was important. But really what we realized as we looked at the early research is that the recommendation for the treatment of substance abuse and uh, opioid use disorder in pregnancy had not changed in 40 years. It was methadone maintenance. Um, a lot of this has to do with these two seminal case studies um, that really, as we looked at, at, at different uh, research, they kept on citing these two authors, Rementeria and Neuring from 1973 and Zuspan et al. from 1975. And those were the studies that as we, and everything said, you know, um, everything that we looked at was methadone, I mean, um, uh, detoxification of pregnancy will result in fetal demise. That was basically the, the bottom line and citing these two, these two studies. So we're going to talk about these with a little bit more detail um, just to kind of see where it got us in terms of methadone maintenance. So uh, I'll start off with the uh, rementeria. One of the things I uh, failed to mention, um, uh, I'm a toxicologist by background as well. And one of the things uh, that I love to discuss is obviously the impact of, a, uh, of any compound uh, on the different, different areas of the body, the reasons of why things happen um, to the molecular level, and really understanding the impact of withdrawal and the risk that withdrawal has on arterial constriction, which is what we're really worried about. And to this day, when a woman presents to an emergency department um, or, or any setting really in withdrawals, really the main focus is the fetus. And the, and the reason obviously being that if the mom is withdrawing at that point in time, the mom may be exhibiting a particular set of symptoms characterized by opioid withdrawal, which we know to be typically uh, nausea, diarrhea, uh, increase in vitals, BP, heart rate and so forth. Uh, but for the fetus, you're talking about um, uh, a risk related to the arterial constriction due to the norepinephrine surge that's occurring, uh, typically a norepinephrine surge, which is typically suppressed by an opioid. Now, without the opioid present, you have this opioid-related surge with norepinephrine causing arterial constriction to the placenta-related arterioles, uh, which can obviously result in lack of oxygen supply. So that's the real risk. So ensuring that we pre prevent that type of uh, withdrawal, that type of cascade is essential. But nevertheless, this Rementeria case in 1973 uh, presented a patient who uh, had uh, multiple interactions with that particular healthcare uh, setting and provider. Uh, they present the case that the individual at 39 weeks delivered a stillbirth. Uh, but the case is further elucidated when you understand what occurred. A patient actually had a history of syphilis, unknown treatment, Poly substance abuse and an increasing habit. So there's reports that the individual was utilizing three bags of heroin and actually increased to six bags of heroin daily the month prior to delivery, the month prior to delivering that stillbirth. Uh, other things that uh, we that it's important to note, there was a note of meconium, 
the speculation as to the risk of meconium, and there was a study um, published in 69, 33% of heroin addicts had meconium. Uh, so the speculation as to what that, that means, we don't know. Other ideologies for the stillbirth are also uh, something to discuss, and this is what we see in our own patient population, meaning these uh, moms typically are not coming in with a purely opioid use disorder. They're coming in with polysubstance uh, presentations, cocaine, amphetamine, uh, other agents, benzodiazepines, sometimes alcohol. Uh, so these are things that always uh, you have to ask yourself, what's the impact of those other agents on the fetus itself? Uh, we know that there is an increasing habit. So in conclusion, Rementoria concluded no apparent harm to the fetus from either methanol maintenance or methanol detox. But nevertheless, there is limitations to this case report, uh, lack of info regarding to the fetal effects of maternal withdrawal. The stillbirth has higher risk in the heroin addiction population. And anoxia needs to be considered, obviously, if the mom was undergoing uh, withdrawals, we know that anoxia was resulting potential risk of stillbirth in this baby. So um, that study had all of, it was one case report again, and that, that's what really we had early on. Uh, Zeuspan in 1975, um, their group was doing actual research on uh, methadone maintenance and me methadone detoxification in pregnancy um, out of Chicago. And it was the University of Chicago plus the Illinois Drug Abuse Program. So they reported on one um, case study, it was, uh, it was titled Fetal Stress from Methadone Withdrawal. And um, they wanted to see by looking at epinephrine and norepinephrine levels, um, of how the fetus was responding to methadone withdrawal. And the way that they did this is that they did four amniocentesis in a one month period. So they would, the woman was on 20 milligrams of methadone. She was being decreased uh, five, about five milligrams at a time. When she got to 10 milligrams, they noted, now we're at the fourth amnio, they noted significant um, fetal distress, so they stopped the with the medication assisted withdrawal basically, and they brought her back up to 15 milligrams of methadone, and which she stayed until she gave birth. Um, this study, I think, is is obviously important because what they the final conclusion or the recommendation is that pregnant patients not be detoxified during pregnancy, especially in the last trimester, unless the scientific means is available to monitor fetal homeostasis. And um, that makes sense because what we had in 1975 is not what we have now um, in terms of being able to, to uh, monitor the fetus, right? Um, the other piece is that um, they note in the study, detoxification during pregnancy, especially in the last trimester, is potentially hazardous to the fetus. And they talk about one loss, which wasn't documented in this study, but there was one uh, stillborn and um, four others that they, it just says there were five intrauterine deaths of fetuses uh, caused by detoxification in the late mid trimester, but they don't really specify how that was. But those are the studies that time and time again, um, we go back to when we talk about why uh, you can't detoxify pregnant women. And um, Alberto and I have been in, in conversations with people in the community and we're basically accused of being baby killers because in our program we do give mothers the option of detoxification. What we're going to show as we go through our talk today is that there have been more and more studies that support uh, detoxification for the well-selected patient and under the right conditions, it is something that, um, that is, is possible. Alberto, did you wanna add anything to this slide? No, you said it at all. So let's talk about methadone maintenance and let's talk about those risks to the fetus, right? Because it is not without risk. Yeah, so I think that when we discuss uh, um, treatment in the substance use population, we typically traditionally talk about the impact of NAS, talk about a treatable disease. Um, but let's talk about a little bit about the fetal risk related to methadone maintenance itself. Studies have shown increased intrauterine growth restriction of up to 25%. Uh, we now know that there's an increased preterm delivery risk. 
uh, severe NAS and long length of stay post delivery that there's been studies that have, uh, had a wide range. We looked at our own healthcare system uh, and we saw days uh, average length of stay for uh, NICU NAS diagnosed babies in the neighborhood of 24 days uh, in, the, in the NICU. Um, Long-term safety and maintenance therapy not well studied and uncertain. So for the most part, what are the prospective studies looking at these babies with this treatable NAS long-term? What are the prospective studies looking at them at five years, 10 years? What are the impacts uh, of this maintenance, methadone maintenance? Uh, we now have information that has uh, NAS linked with educational disabilities in early childhood, emerging information, uh, with some recent studies on long-term ocular abnormalities, changes in brain structure and head circumference. We also have information pertaining to neurobehavior abnormalities related to polysubstance abuse, and obviously other possible multigenerational effects. So, so it, in a nutshell, we know that methadone maintenance uh, has a significant place in the treatment, but it's not without its fetal risk, which is something that we're starting to see merging in literature. And now, in addition, it isn't just the risk of the fetus, but also what are, what's the maternal risk? And so um, I, in designing a program and looking at uh, methadone versus buprenorphine, these are some of the things that we wanted to look at. So um, I think we all agree that the continued use of illicit drugs and the associated lifestyle is, uh, poses the greatest threat to the well-being of both mom and baby. And that's why maintenance, you know, all other things considered is, is uh, the course of treatment that we want to take. But if there's other things that we need to think about. So um, Delano um, et al. in 2013, they looked at a, uh, a high-risk population, and this was in Canada, and they basically just looked at meconium samples that had been referred through either the hospital or protective serv services, and they, because of suspected uh, uh, substance use at delivery by the mom. And um, they were able to compare uh, people who were who were on methadone maintenance versus people who were just women who were just using drugs without being on methadone maintenance. And they found no significant difference in terms of um, other opioid use at birth and then other um, poly substance. So we talked about amphetamine, cocaine, cannabis, alcohol. So there were similar rates. One of the concerns is that even on methadone maintenance, it's not keeping women from using other illicit substances. So that this calls for an approach that isn't just, okay, here, come to the clinic, we're gonna give you your pill every day, or your, and, then, and then you go on about your way. Um, the methadone uh, clinics have restrictive access, so it's harder to uh, ensure that care is uh, comprehensive. Um, in some places, it's hard to get to the methadone clinic. It could take all day just to go and get your dose. So um, there is a stigma associated with it, but also challenges in terms of transportation, lifestyle, uh, being able to do other things like work in school. There is increased risk for C-section. Um, increasing doses for the mom over the, the time of the pregnancy. And I think for us, one case that Alberto and I always go back to was a, a young lady that we worked with early on in our Mothers in Recovery program. And she had been on methadone for 10 years, um, but increasing use of opioids, crack cocaine, and high, high doses of uh, benzodiazepines. She was using Xanax. So um, she was also in a, in a relationship that was with the same person, but it was a, a relationship marked by um, domestic violence. And she'd had, she came to us on her sixth pregnancy. So her previous five births, uh, all babies were either adopted or they were in the child welfare system. So she didn't have any of, of the of her kids with her. And she really, she came to us having been on methadone maintenance, so the standard of care, requesting something different because she knew that she didn't want to put having seen her babies being born and being in the NICU for extended stays, uh, all kinds of complications. She didn't want, she, she said to us, I don't want to have to put another child through that again. So um, it's important to think about what some of the, the other repercussions are of methadone maintenance in and of itself. I'll, I'll say, let me add a few things on the methadone component. You mentioned the increasing doses. Um, I think it's important to note 
when we're discussing methadone. Methadone is an agent uh, that's uh, uh, specifically dependent on volume of distribution. With that being said, um, the fact that um, the mom throughout pregnancy uh, increases her volume of distribution to a degree that the individual is actually in need of increasing that methadone to meet the same demands. So you have many moms that may start off on a, on a very low dose of methadone, but towards the end of the pregnancy, the methadone dose has increased significantly to meet that volume of distribution that the mother is going through uh, because of the increase in fluid demands. Now, one of the things that we've encountered and we've seen in, uh, in, in our population are those individuals coming uh, from methadone is that many of them that have given birth before are now delivering on a very high dose of methadone. Now afterwards, obviously they're going back to methadone maintenance, continuing on that regimen, and it becomes very challenging for them. It becomes very challenging to, to decrease that methadone dose. And one of the things that they've noted is that uh, they've had um, difficulties in actually reducing that upper level dose that they were on when, when they were titrated up on that methadone throughout pregnancy. So it's something to note that there are significant differences when it comes to the pharmacokinetics of these two agents, buprenorphine and methadone, which is what makes them very different when it comes to how you dose individuals who are uh, pregnant during substance use disorder treatments for opioid addiction. So um, that uh, with the buprenorphine as an alternative to methadone, it was really the opportunity for um, improved access to care for us and for uh, as we designed our program to have a care that was integrated. And it was, we realized very early on that it was going to be impossible to do that if the people that we treated were on um, methadone. Um, one of the uh, a model that is um, is a national model, which is uh, the Children and Recovering Mothers Collaborative. It's called CHARM. Um, and this model is out of Vermont. And it really came out of that same necessity where um, they had increasing rates of uh, pregnant women with opioid use disorders, limited access to methadone. And so they um, basically created like a, a hub and spoke where uh, the care was um, initiated through the OB provider generally or, or the hospital. And then um, the OB provider manages the uh, buprenorphine that the woman is placed on. And then that, that becomes the hub. Uh, but then all of the other uh, programs or other systems are, are put in, such as substance abuse treatment, um, child welfare. Uh, you have a uh, multiple of uh, multiple organizations coming together in order to treat the pregnant woman and have improved outcomes related to the to the child so um, basically the what i think for us what has the difference between using buprenorphine versus methadone and that doesn't mean that in other communities methadone isn't um, a treatment of choice but the idea that we know what works in terms of treating this patient population is a uh, treatment that's multidisciplinary, right? It can't just be substance abuse treatment on its own. It can't just be the OB piece on its own. It has to be working together, including social services. Behavioral therapies have to be um, integrated with the opioid replacement therapy as well. Um, having uh, specialized training and education, so staff that are working with this patient population really need to be um, educated on the needs of this population and uh, on concepts such as um, you know collaboration and integrated treatment um, that's why having this discussion today is really vital so that if we really have been able to decrease the number of uh, you know boys of, of babies born substance exposed then in, in order to maintain that low we need to do things like what we're doing today um, the other issues are making sure that we're screening pregnant women as much as possible and that we're assessing them carefully about what their needs are. And that includes social determinants of health, social determinants of mental health. Those things need to be uh, woven into the care, the approach to care. Um, women should be given, given options. So um, maintenance or detoxification, how, how they engage in treatment. I, I think that you know, they, they should have a say and, and 
looking at what evidence-based models are out there, um, and that there are emerging ones. Um, but more, more than anything is making sure that care is, um, is accessible and that it's comprehensive, right? And, then and, it's, and, it's and I'm gonna add something, uh, Claudia. I think Marie said it very well earlier. Identification is, is, is very important. Um, we know that it's challenging and, and for the most part, if you look at our numbers, our numbers aren't um, dramatic in the amount of patients that we've served. And it has a lot to do with how do you, how do these women find uh, the services? How do you identify a woman that actually is uh, using uh, substances? It could be any substance truly, uh, but even opioids and opioids, we know we've run into challenges. We know that we have, uh, uh, now this, the stream of uh, what's out there is changed from heroin into fentanyl and to fentanyl like analogs. So while before we could do an easy drug screen potentially, now does a drug screen catch fentanyl? Does a drug screen screen for fentanyl like analogs, which is changing uh, very often. So how do, how do you know that this individual is actually utilizing an opioid? Um, and then engagement, engagement is extremely crucial. Um, we know that even in our, our own healthcare system, a very large emergency department, women may present at all hours of the night. How do you ensure that you have a robust program that if a woman presents, all individuals know that this is what we do. This is the process. This is how we initiate the program. Because the moment that uh, mom is starting to have withdrawals, there's two things that are gonna happen. Number one, obviously, the great risk to the baby and potential fetal harm. But moreover, you're going to have a mom that now is going to be very difficult to engage. If they're going through active withdrawal, they're not going to want anything to do with your program because they feel sick. They want to leave. They want to go stop this withdrawal that's happening at this, this point in time. So that education is extremely important, trying to ensure that we understand what's happening with the mother and, and fetus and the diet and what's happening at the current time with the withdrawals is crucial to ensuring we can engage these moms. Excellent. So th this slide is actually the most recent information that we have um, federally, which is from 2012. And it looks like the, at the treatment episode data set. Um, and this is actually goes back to Marie's point in the middle. So when you, when you look at a pregnant woman looking for treatment, right? And for 40 years, we've had the standard of care, which is methadone maintenance. However, when that woman goes to access treatment, only 13% of outpatient facilities offer uh, services specifically for pregnant women. And that's also 13% of residential and then only 7% of hospital inpatient programs. If you look in the, at the slide on the, on the right, on the, the graphic on the right, it tells you when these women were accessing treatment, um, the majority of, uh, of it was detoxification services. So despite having the standard of care, that's not the care that was being received. Now, this does not include, and, and I think that Marie's um, data actually spoke to this, in 2017, we've had a large influx of federal funding uh, for the opioid epidemic that um, first and foremost put opioid, put medication assisted treatment either with methadone, uh, naltrexone or with buprenorphine as the evidence-based practice. And that, that was the, the basically changing the standard of care. We do not know what the impact of that uh, federal funding has been in uh, access to treatment and what availability of treatment is out there. But we know from uh, Broward County, we experienced, you know, we were part of one of the only, one of three groups three uh, organizations that were offering medication assisted treatment when that f first funding came through. And we based all of our um, medic MAP programs for the general population on the principles that we learned from working in the Mothers in Recovery program. Um, so as of one of three providers in Broward County, we saw that the access to care increased uh, tremendously. And hopefully that change from 27, 2016 to 2017 has to do with how we've made treatment more accessible. Um, besides access to treatment, this is a study that looked at um, a national cohort of women that were entering into substance abuse treatment who were pregnant um, and what the characteristics were. So this is in 2013. Um, and it, this is uh, some of the social determinants of health that Alberta was alluding to. So um, the majority of these women were white. 
the majority unemployed. Um, they did have health insurance, generally through Medicaid. Um, most of them had also polysubstance use. Um, and depending on the region, and we know this uh, when we look at sort of prescribing practices that were going on at the time, um, that you know what, whether it was for a prescription opiate or, or heroin, uh, depending on the region. And then uh, if they were given access to medication-assisted treatment, again, of the South, 30, only 31% had medication-assisted treatment. Um, those numbers were higher in the Midwest, the West, and the Northeast, but not that much higher. And uh, on this slide? Uh, yeah, I had a few things, a lot of few things um, uh, relative to our program, similar uh, high rates, uh, majority of the, of the moms coming in uh, Caucasian, um, which is interesting. We have uh, obviously a diverse population in Broward County. We have uh, gone into the community setting and uh, attempted to engage uh, populations, uh, different uh, minority populations. What are the challenges? What are the barriers to engaging them in treatment? Those are things we constantly uh, battle with and struggle with. Are we, do we ourselves have barriers in our own healthcare system that's preventing them from accessing care? These are all things that we, we ask and we question. Polysubstance is a significant issue, meaning we have very few cases of purely opioid. Uh, the majority are polysubstance. The majority have uh, something on board, either cocaine or benzodiazepine which makes it even more challenging in what you do uh, to engage them into to engage them into the treatment, what you do with the benzodiazepine on board or cocaine, because the cocaine, perhaps you're not worried about the withdrawals. Um, if you're over the initial use, obviously uh, cocaine toxicity is very uh, troublesome and toxic to the fetus and mom. But uh, at that point in time, if you're using cocaine, cocaine is gonna be an easy avenue to have an individual relapse in the future if you're not uh, addressing the issues that are resulting in the cocaine use. When it comes to prescription opioid, I think we have had a, a significant amount of uh, purely regional prescribed individuals and then turned to heroin. The dynamics are changing. So across the country, we're seeing, uh, I mentioned earlier, fentanyl, these um, fentanyl analogs. And what we're seeing coming in from the, from the fronts of Mexico is a significant amount of, of fentanyl in these analogs and then coming in uh, from the East Coast and then the North United States through uh, shipments and through mail from China, highly synthetic, powerful uh, fentanyl analogs that are going into our, our community. So I, so for the most part, we, we, will, we have seen a decrease in prescription opioids, as mentioned earlier. We're going to continue to see that because of the restrictions across the country. Uh, but what are we going to be seeing in the future when it comes to the fentanyl and the fentanyl analogs is yet to be determined. So, um, so that we know that even though the standard of care is methadone maintenance, um, the actual care being provided uh, was detoxification with some maintenance as well. So um, Alberto's going to talk a little bit about what studies have been published to support uh, detoxification in pregnancy. So we, we have a time, we have a little brief history in uh, detoxification in pregnancy. So DASHI. Uh, published something in 1998, 34 patients uh, using methadone were detoxified uh, with 59% drug-free uh, delivery, 12% uh, maintenance, 29% relapse rate. But the take-home message in his in the publication was the no fetal distress demise or uterine uterine growth restriction or preterm delivery in the population. So, giving credence to our is the act of detoxifying result in potential fetal demise or any risk of preterm delivery? And the answer in this particular DASH study was no. That was followed in 2013 uh, with Stewart, who had 95 patients also using methadone at the time. And uh, once again, 95 patients, 56 uh, had drug-free at delivery. And the main here message, no fetal distress, demise, or interunion growth retardation or preterm delivery. Prior to Stewart, there is a, a study uh, in 2008 by Jones. We've talked about that a couple of times. Jones also had two, uh, two different opportunities. So individuals had ability to have methadone maintenance or methadone detoxification. Once again, no fetal risk uh, outlined in that particular study for, for Jones et al. 
Lund also had uh, another uh, study uh, which was summarizing the effects of Jones and colleagues, detoxification, complete withdrawal, decreased NAS. So here we're starting to see the first signs that individuals that are detoxified during pregnancy, uh, number one, you have uh, results indicating that there's no risk of fetal demise, uh, no risk of uh, on the fetus, on toward risk, but also that we're seeing now first signs that you may have decreased NAS rates in these moms. Um, you had similar information coming out at 2016 uh, with Bell, uh, Bell and Towers. Now they had a rather robust study out of Tennessee, uh, over 300 patients. One of the main outcomes, obviously looking at adverse fetal outcomes. And once again, no uh, indicated fetal harm or fetal demise in this patient population. And they had an opportunity to have individuals detoxified uh, during different uh, mechanisms. One of them was they followed patients that were actually incarcerated. These incarcerated individuals, because of lack of access in the jail system, the opioids had to be uh, rapidly detoxified during their stay. No risk of uh, fetal uh, negative outcomes in that population. They also had two different arms. Um, one of the arms allowed for individuals to be hospitalized uh, with follow-up to uh, outpatient services. And the other one had the same thing, individual inpatient admission, but no follow-up, both arms, uh, no reported fetal harm. And then lastly, it was a long-term detoxification outpatient, slow detoxification taper, which is similar to what we do, and that, as well, no risk of fetal harm. And then finally, a recent study in 2020, just telling, giving you some of the changing times that we're having, some of the different options, and we know we does medication-assisted treatment. We know medication-assisted treatment involves pharmacotherapeutics in the realms of the buprenorphine, like we've been discussing, methadone, and we also have naltrexone. Naltrexone being a long-acting uh, formulation of the sister naloxone, which is an opioid antagonist. Uh, so we have Towers uh, publishing a study uh, with 230 individuals uh, looking at naltrexone group versus the buprenorphine and methadone group, showing, number one, no risk of stillbirth or spontaneous abortion in the naltrexone group, but more importantly, a very robust reduction in NAS rates, NAS rates of 8.4% in the naltrexone arm versus 75.2% in the buprenorphine methadone arm, and no difference between the buprenorphine and methadone noted in the study. So really showing us that uh, we have different options available, showing us that detoxification in pregnancy has been shown to not result in fetal risk or fetal harm, and we have a potential to have decreased risk of NAS if done in a proper uh, program, and it's safe when controlled, and the relapse reduced with appropriate behavioral health support uh, in these studies. Yeah, one of the things that stood out to me with the Bell study is that uh, one of the key factors in preventing relapse after the woman is detoxified, and I mean, let's be frank, that's what we're concerned about, is that, so the, the key factor was that there was some sort of behavioral program, some sort of structured program is what made the difference in terms of the woman not relapsing um, after being detoxified. And that could have been an intensive outpatient program, um, a residential program, there was a, a women who had been in jail as well. Um, but but to me, you know, the, the idea that you can have a, a well-structured intensive outpatient program like ours can make the difference between a woman being detoxified and not relapsing um, really because of having the appropriate behavioral support. So now we get to the, the fun part, I think. Well, I think it's all been fun, but this is uh, talking about our program, which is the Mothers in Recovery program, which we started in 2015. Um, and for the, for our program, oh, wait, hold on, I'm doing that. Sorry. Here we go. Yes, okay. So um, guiding principles for us really were, was about reducing the rates of NAS, um, pr promoting maternal recovery, which is a process. Um, creating recovery-oriented family environments, recovery-oriented system of care, something that we talk a lot about um, in the substance abuse treatment of, um, 
milieu and in, in our in our community is what access to treatment do people have and how is that not just about substance abuse treatment but about like the the health and the well-being of the person and of the community and that that involves anything from um involving uh peer support special peer specialists in um in the treatment process of having access to other services including social services um, education vocational rehabilitation all these things are really important um, obviously providing a, a an approach that's integrated and multidisciplinary research is pretty clear that that is um, associated with improved outcomes um, and then looking at how this is from from a hospital perspective how this program has impacted our hospital and our resources. What resources do we need to use in order to have a program like this? I think one principle that isn't on here, but really should be, and Alberto can speak to this as well, is how it how important it is to be non-judgmental in working with this patient population, uh, to have a respectful attitude to the to the people that we're working with, um, the caregivers that are, are part of our program really understand, and it, it's an ongoing education process, um, but really making sure that we're looking at the person as a whole person and that our approach is comprehensive. Um, and, and that non-judgmental piece is so key. So in terms of the standard of care, really we wanted to see how we can evolve. When we looked at the early research, we looked at what was being recommended, um, and then we looked at how we can take that initial model and, um, and bring it to the next level. So that involves, um, and this is something that we're currently doing now um, in Florida, but are we doing universal screening for substance abuse in pregnancy? You know, How often are we looking at um, women of reproductive age and looking at how opioid prescribing is affecting them. Um, when uh, we have women of reproductive age and substance abuse treatment, are we offering long-acting contraceptives? How often are we talking to them about what their options are or what they've even considered in terms of family planning? Um, making sure that, that uh, our our approach is team-based uh, and comprehensive, especially when working with pregnant women, um, and making sure that we're looking at those high-risk populations and how, how do we target services and, and develop outreach for them, um, and then improving really access to treatment, and, and Alberto's gonna talk a little bit more about having a phased approach on, on what we do. To, to uh, in, in, in the next slide, you see the a depiction of an this one. Oh, uh, okay, that's fine. You can stay there. So, I thought you were going to do the ED order set slide. Oh, it's on there. Hold on, I got it. So, I think that uh, to Claudia's point, the principles of uh, of the program, and I mentioned earlier, access to care is extremely crucial. Uh, an individual presenting to the emergency department or, or, or any level of care and active withdrawals. I think the time is of the essence, and I mentioned earlier, time of the essence for the baby. Uh, we've had uh, reports in the past, even in our own healthcare system, before we started the program, of a mom presenting, and by the time we got ward in the early days uh, of the initiation, mom may have been there 12 hours, uh, 16 hours waiting, um, so it's ensuring that we're not increasing the, the fetal risk uh, because the mom is going through withdrawals. And but moreover, what we mentioned. So now we want to have a we want to have the ability to engage this mom. We want to have the ability to say we are not we're not. This is an, a judge free zone. This is an area to try to engage you into treatment. These are the options that we have available. And a lot goes with that, which with, when it comes to how a clinician uh, engages them, treats them talks about the different aspects of the program. So we've had a, a, a significant change in, in really the culture of our healthcare system. You're talking about a very large, large healthcare system. Um, over five different sister hospitals, our emergency department sees over 110,000 patients, 130,000 patients per year. So very busy ED with your typical emergency issues related to strokes, um, myocardial infarctions, Things that are going on, and now you have a pregnant mom coming in, withdrawing, and really the 
the dynamics have changed to the point where the provider understands the programs that we have, understands the quick access to care is, is crucial. And with that, an order set that we created, uh, part of our electronic medical record um, system, allows a clinician to quickly navigate the system and say, this is what I need to do. This order set tells me I'm engaging the right individuals. I'm screening for the right things I need to, to do for this individual. I'm getting OB involved at an earlier uh, Time frame. I'm getting the medication assisted treatment team involved, the MER team involved, so that we can already start the process to do that, to get this individual engaged in treatment, to prevent the withdrawals, to make sure that no negative outcomes happen in this baby. So it's crucial, in my opinion, when we've talked to other healthcare systems, even some local healthcare systems that have attempted to put programs together, one of the main issues they have is timing, timing of engagement, timing of initiation because that timing is in the, in the first few hours is crucial and you will lose that patient and not be able to engage it further. Yeah, I think that the, for us, the order set was a, a really cost-effective way to standardize care and to make care accessible. So we uh, realized very early on that the entry point for treatment had to be the emergency department uh, because it allowed for a pregnant woman who was seeking care to be able to get it immediately without having to um, exhaust resources. Of, of course, that includes um, a lot of education between the, the nursing staff and the, the physicians that are working in the emergency department. Um, but one of the things that came out of the state opioid response was the funding that we, we received starting in 2017 throughout the whole state of Florida was to put peer specialists in, in emergency departments to uh, help people who were having had an opioid overdose and try to engage them in treatment. Um, we've had a navigator for the Mothers in Recovery program. This is a, a licensed mental health counselor who uh, before it was a licensed clinical social worker and before that it was me who really worked in the emergency department to try to navigate that pregnant woman through the treatment. What the order said allowed us to do is um, the physician treating the person knows exactly what to do and our multidisciplinary team for Mothers in Recovery and for medication assisted treatment is a clinical pharmacy specialist, it's a social worker, and a peer specialist. So now we know that we can get the woman, the, the make sure that the labs are done correctly, make sure that OB is involved, and then our team can come in and, and start the engagement piece. Um, and that's really what the, the outline of our program really is starting in the emergency department, um, going into a, a short inpatient induction. Um, do you wanna talk a little bit about that, that phase, Alberto? Yeah, the, so I think that the induction, so the ER admission engagement is crucial. Induction to us uh, in the earlier phase, uh, uh, the induction resulted in, in, a, in proper induction can result in obviously significant withdrawals uh, in the mom. So it was crucial for us to understand uh, the dynamics of initiating buprenorphine in the, in the population that's challenging. Number one, you're pregnant, so you're 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 suffering from a variety of uh, issues already happening to you. Meaning, in the earlier stages, you are you may have an individual that has significant nausea and vomiting just because of the pregnancy. Now you're adding on uh, potential withdrawals, and we know that when we initiate buprenorphine, uh, because buprenorphine is known as a partial agonist, you have to be careful in the induction phase. If you do it too soon, you could precipitate withdrawals. So it's crucial to do it at the right time. So when we when we created our induction, um, we did we did so uh, with our maternal fetal medicine physician, Dr. Lori Scott. Um, and in doing so, one of the things that we created was to ensure we're monitoring the fetus during this process to make sure we're monitoring for any signs of distress. So in the earlier uh, days of the induction. One, when we initiated, one would look at what's the proper dose to induct these moms. So that had to do with history of how much um, opioid they were using. But more than important than anything was how significant the withdrawals were uh, at a certain time frame. That would really tell us we would need to induct them with a particular dose. We would continue to monitor them. And more importantly, look, make sure that the baby's doing okay. So it's one thing to understand if the mom is not exhibiting signs of withdrawals, but is the baby exhibiting signs of fetal distress? Are we looking at the fetal heart tones? Are we looking at to see if the baby is moving more or less? 
So these are things that were extremely crucial during the induction phases. And what we learned uh, early on in the first few months is that we were able to control withdrawals within uh, opioid related withdrawals within 24 hours. So within 24 hours of presentation, mom's uh, withdrawals were significantly reduced, evidenced by the COWS uh, score, clinical withdrawal scale scores were significantly reduced compared to baseline. Um, and at the same time, the babies were exhibiting uh, a good behavior. There weren't any issues related to distress. There weren't any issues with uh, significant accelerations in the fetus. So these were signs that the induction was done correctly and extremely crucial to ensuring that there wasn't any untoward harm to the baby as well. We start early on, so we're engaging from outreach for the person being in the community, then through the emergency department. Uh, we talked about the need for people who are specially trained or have uh, an understanding of working with this patient population. I think that's why it's important. During the inpatient induction phase, our, our team continues to work with this patient and follow them through. Um, we do all of the coordination for discharge planning. Uh, we don't, um, you know, that's something that our team does. And uh, the goal and the way that our program is designed is that they discharge um, to uh, supportive housing. We work with different providers in the community that work with pregnant women and women with young children. Um, they will uh, basically reside at those programs once they discharge, and then they are uh, transported to our intensive outpatient facility during the day where they are treated by our physician, where they uh, we do different evidence-based models such as dialectical behavior therapy. So basically we're coordinating all the services uh, while they are in the outpatient phase of treatment. Once, if the woman decides um, and chooses to uh, detoxification, then um, once she is completely off the, um, buprenorphine, she has the option of returning home or uh, sometimes depending on what the housing situation is, they will go off into a residential substance abuse treatment program. And I think it's important that we look at what strategies are most effective in order to design these programs and we have to be able to go beyond substance abuse treatment. So it has to be that integrated piece with OB, right? You have to look at what are the mental health issues. So we're seeing high rates of um, co-occurring psychiatric disorders in our patient population, um, making sure that the care that we provide is trauma-informed. Um, a lot of issues with uh, trauma that need to be addressed. Um, housing is really important and sort of drives the process as we look at the assessment of what the patient needs and making sure that the care is individualized. Other issues such as uh, education, employment, parenting, um, what's the support system in the person's life. So we really look at all these factors and um, it's something that you continue to do as, as we work with the patients. So I think that uh, discussing antepartum and I think the next slide is, uh, is intrapartum, um, but it's the, the, the understanding that you now have uh, a couple scenarios. Number one, you have an individual if they're if they're going into uh, a delivery, what type of delivery are they going to uh, have? Are they going to have a regular delivery? Going to have a C-section? Obviously, if we have a C-section, we're worried about uh, risk during the C-section. The medications that they may use, like a Nubane. So what are the interactions, the risk of uh, having somebody on Nubain and uh, resulting in having uh, precipitated withdrawals can present itself. But, I, but it's more important to understand other risks. So the risk of an individual who's in program who we've been treating for uh, weeks to months, and now they're going into a procedure if they do have a C-section and they're going to have significant pain, they are, there's a high likelihood that they're going to be restarted on opioid uh, medication regimen. So if for us, it was crucial to work with uh, the, post, the post phase to ensure that individuals who were started on an opioid, that the, the guideline was you were going to be started on the particular opioid, uh, decrease the amount of load, meaning if we can have other agents on board, an NSAID, uh, acetaminophen to reduce 
the pain level, we would do that. But it's also the mindset of the mom, the mom preparing them to understand you're going into this phase, you're going into the phase that you're going to be exhibiting uh, particular symptoms, but you're going to be suffering for a particular level of pain. And what's the likelihood that these individuals now have uh, a lower threshold for pain because of their history. So understanding that there may be a need to use an opioid depending on the significance and how severe uh, the pain is, but at the same time, guiding them to say, we're gonna use this for a limited time and then hope, hoping for that opioid-free discharge. And that's actually worked uh, very well with us. So initially there was some challenges to that, but now most moms who deliver, besides the fact that uh, a regular delivery, but those that deliver in C-section, it's all now a, a good transition. There's a collaboration between the different providers. Um, and these providers are now talking so that we know what the plan is. We know that, these, that we have patients that may need an initial component, an initial trial of the opioid during that time frame, but then leaving into an opioid-free environment is crucial if we have a mom that has detoxified completely in our program. Yeah, and I think that the for one of the take homes is, is that when we're, we're providing these very coordinated, targeted um, comprehensive services while the woman is pregnant, that after she gives birth, that we continue to make those that same approach accessible um, uh, because she's more vulnerable to relapse after she's had the baby. Uh, we need to continue to engage them and, and um, make sure that we're providing them with support. Uh, and I think that that's where the idea of a recovery oriented system of care. I mean, there's many times when we've uh, helped reestablish relationships with family members um, that had, you know, um, helped repair relationships really that had uh, fallen apart after years of, of um, continued substance use by the mom. Um, very often, and we didn't talk about this, but the partner is also using, so how do we get the partner into treatment and prioritizing that? And um, education on parenting, I think infant mental health issues, the bonding, all of those um, are really important. Um, for us in our program, we've served since 2015, 145 um, moms. And of our program patients, 91% uh, of babies born to our program patients are born drug-free. Um, when we look at recovery rates, so very high in the first three months and dropping off in the six to 12 months, what we've seen since starting medication-assisted treatment is that over time, and we go 12 months, but really if we went out further, what we're seeing is, is that women are um, recognizing maybe when they, um, if they've maintained um, recovery that they need to come back into treatment. Um, and often we will um, just they'll come into our medication assisted treatment when they're not pregnant. It gives us an opportunity to really talk about, um, again, those issues of um, making uh, family planning choices and looking at their future and being able to really look at the whole person. Uh, what are their goals regarding education? What are their goals regarding employment? Um, and, and seeing how having another child or, or having an unexpected pregnancy would fall, fall into that. And I'll add uh, one of the things that we've had uh, an opportunity to expand, uh, this wasn't the case uh, at the beginning of the program, uh, especially due to funding, is access to long-acting naltrexone, so postpartum. So that's, it, that's added a new arm uh, for us, for some of those moms that are now opioid-free, that are now willing to engage and continue into, in our program uh, and continue on a MAT-related service but that's not an opioid agonist that's actually acting like an opioid antagonist as an injectable form. So that's another arm that we have now started uh, in the last few years. And uh, for us, so we, we have some funding from uh, the state of Florida that we've received. Um, and in order to uh, continue getting that funding, we have to uh, calculate our return on investment. So the state of Florida uh, estimates that every, the average uh, NAS birth uh, costs $144,681, um, which is not just the, the costs associated with the hospital fees, uh, costs of Medicaid, Medicaid, but also child welfare, Department of Justice, Medicaid, all these other things, right? Um, and so in the three years of our program, we've saved uh, our return on investment is over $12 million. 
Um, and then I think for us, the, the most satisfying thing has been not only the people that we get to work with and the, and the, the mothers that come in and then come back and, and, you know, all of these healthy babies and these families that are doing um, incredible because of the mom being in treatment, but taking that model of um, care that is integrated, that's accessible, and that's comprehensive, and then applying it across our healthcare system and our community in other ways. So Mothers in Recovery sort of formed the blueprint for our medication-assisted treatment program, um, our uh, emergency department engagement program. We have, uh, we have peer specialists, cl clinical pharmacists, and social workers that are in the emergency department. Well, not right now, but after, before, before COVID. Um, but then we have people in, uh, we still have some people in the emergency department, just not as many, but the goal is how do we get people, because we're still seeing um, high rates of uh, opioid overdose, right, Alberto? We're still seeing high rates of people coming in. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's a great, uh, great point. Um, obviously, when this first started happening, well, the, the, the recommendation about wearing masks and gowning up, it's everything's been changing so fast. So we do have a, a few individuals that do go to the emergency department to engage if needed. And typically, obviously, they have to be full mask and so forth. Um, the point is, is that it's still occurring, meaning we're still having patients presenting um, with overdoses. We're still having patients presenting with other issues like osteomyelitis, endocarditis. We still have moms presenting, uh, seeking yeah. help for uh, uh, withdrawing from opioids. So, I, so this has obviously shocked everybody, but having the services in place and having uh, the system in place with how we have uh, the electronic medical record uh, operating, the, the consults operating, it's still working. It's still operating, thank God, through this time. Yeah, and one of the things that we saw in the second week of March, the substance abuse treatment providers in Broward County and the mental health uh, treatment providers in Broward County just stopped seeing patients. They stopped accepting new patients um, and they, you know, everything went to virtual. So there was nowhere for somebody that, again, you know, here's another barrier to treatment. You're not, you're, you're, uh, have the substance use disorder and you don't know where to get treatment anymore. So we're uh, basically one of two providers that is um, accepting new patients and we are i think the only emergency department still that is actively engaging people in the emergency department into substance abuse treatment including pregnant women um and i think with that that concludes our talk we're a little bit over but thank you guys very much thank you guys Okay, well, thank you, Claudia and Alberto, for a very, very comprehensive presentation, uh, not only of the history of detoxification treatment, but also about your program. And I think that was just terrific. And um, especially, you know, uh, as we, um, in current atmosphere and current time, I, that was something on my mind, and I'm glad you addressed it. What happens to the opioid overdose um, patients at this time, you know, do they get screened for COVID uh, as well when they present in the emergency? Yeah, we, I'll speak to that a little bit. So we have the uh, same, same procedures. Patient comes in, um, if it's overdose, you treat the overdose. Once they come to, you uh, just like everybody else, same uh, when it comes to symptoms, um, exposure, fever. I would say that in our our transition clinic, which so our transition clinic serves to continue to manage those patients that were seen in the emergency department, initiated, and now we're transitioning them to the next level of care. Given the state of affairs, meaning a lot of the pr programs in the community, and this is probably the case in many areas, you, uh, you're going to have a difficult time sending that patient somewhere, and it's going to be very challenging virtually for a provider to be willing to prescribe a controlled substance like a MAP uh, product. So these individuals are in our transition clinic. Our census for our transition clinic has doubled and they're staying there for longer periods of time. With that being said, now in this last week, we've already had a few patients with fevers, potential exposures. There are our own clinicians are now fully gowned up, sending them to our ED tents to get COVID testing and then go ahead and sending them home with a two week supply of Suboxone while we await the results of the COVID tested and potential quarantine. So to your point, it's happening. And it, it doesn't mean that they're gonna stop using 
one of the things that we thought about early on is that because of this quarantine risk, obviously, if there's not much to do, many times they're going to go and relate to doing what they're used to doing, which is maybe they're going to be more products. So our system is still in place, and obviously the challenges are still exist. For sure, for sure. Now I'd like to uh, open it to the um, to the rest of the, the panel. Is in, anyone has questions for Alberta or um, for Alberto or Claudia? I'm imagining. Oh, oh Claudia, I meant to uh, to ask you. You know, when you were talking about this patient um, of yours with um, six um, pregnancy. Um, and obviously with a uh, dependence issue, uh, was there any discussion about contraceptive at this point, at this, you know? Yeah, that's actually a great question because one of the things that um, I think by having integrated treatment and having a, a working relationship with the prenatal care and the OB that, that's uh, working with this patient, we can start to have those discussions. and give her the option to say, you know, what is it that you want to do going forward regarding um, accidental pregnancies? Obviously, she was not using contraceptives uh, before she came into our program, but once we engage her in engaged her in treatment, um, she was able to have a meaningful discussion, establish care with an OBGYN, and then um, get on the contraceptive. I think for her, the decision was, um, I can't remember. Maybe Alberta can remember. I don't know if she was on a was probably placed on a long acting. Um, was what what was decided. Sometimes they, in her case, she'd had you know multiple births. Um, I think she she I think the discussion at least was made about um, having a tubal ligation done. She actually had uh, yeah. actually tubal ligation uh, and it the and um and it's it, what was interesting. Uh, unfortunate but interesting after her sixth birth on methadone uh six babies on methadone the the, the last birth resulted in a NICU NAS admission for over 90 days which is what brought her to us saying hey, I don't want you know I don't want this anymore and she was actually pregnant for the seventh time but then she actually had a tubal ligation and it turns out that she had a sister in Tennessee that also was uh Methadone. Uh, so, so uh, um, exactly what you're trying to detox the patient, uh, if possible, is what I understand, um, and trying to have the baby uh, delivered uh, not addicted. Uh, that's my understanding. And are you detoxifying using buprenorphone? Is that what I'm gathering from what you stated? And when, what's the process of that typically? How long does that typically take you to get to a point of not having any buprenorphine on board? I could take that, Claudia. Uh, yeah, it's buprenorphine. So we're using buprenorphine uh, without naloxone. So the, the just the buprenorphine itself. Uh, uh, related to, I think what's interesting is the the dosing. Uh, and many of the studies that we mentioned today described, and they they will describe the dosing range between eight to sixteen milligrams of uh, buprenorphine. Our patient range is a neighborhood of eight to 12 milligrams. The majority of our moms are well controlled uh, by the end of the first week on an inpatient unit on eight milligrams. Uh, the majority, uh, over 90%. And now that individual, once they get, say, leave the inpatient unit, once we've done the induction, once we've done the uh, uh, fetal heart tones monitoring and so forth, and continuation on the outpatient setting uh, with appropriate management and engagement. Um, we then continue to uh, lower the, the dose if the mom uh, chooses so. Meaning, obviously, this is uh, based on a, a, a need and want from the mom. And if that is the case, then we slowly taper them over the course of four to six weeks. Now, that's uh, plus or minus. Some moms need a little bit longer. Um, some moms a little bit uh, shorter time frame to complete that uh, detoxification. Yeah, and in order to assess the appropriateness for detoxification and how long that detoxification is going to take place if we decide on that, there's multiple factors that we look at. Obviously, gestational age is going to drive the process. So uh, we accept women in our program regardless of uh, what whether they're in the first, second, or third trimester. Um, and um, we look at what are the other psychosocial issues going on and what are the other psychiatric issues. So all of those these things together and determine how 
long uh, if they're a candidate for detoxification and then how long uh, the taper process is going to take. So like Alberto said, it could be anywhere um, between, um, I think our shortest is about four weeks, right, Alberto, four to six? Yep. yep. Yeah, and then it could be much longer than that. We've, we've tapered people very gradually over the course of months as well. Claudia and uh, Alberto, of course, uh, many of us know of your work, uh, which is excellent. I think we really need to get this published and uh, out there because there still is some resistance, even with with your work and with the work of Dr. Towers, uh, to, to detox the patient who agrees to have it done. So my only comment would be uh, we need to move along with that. I think that's... Uh, uh, a very important, and your program has certainly grown, and it's it's a model for those of us who have patients who may be candidates for detoxification. Uh, here in Sarasota, we've not had as many as I thought we would, but at least it got us uh, started uh, down some other roads that have been a benefit. But uh, let, let, let's get it published as soon as we can and and, and continue to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're uh, Alberta actually working with Dr. Lori Scott to um, to take our preliminary findings and and get it published. So that that's definitely on our to do list. And it's before all of this happened, we were um, starting to to get everything together. We spent some time. Um, there was some interest from um, the First Lady Casey DeSantis and um, Secretary Mayhew um, in our program and creating a uh, pilot that we can replicate throughout Florida and maybe select a couple of sites uh, throughout the state. Um, I think one of the things that's heartening to me is that we've been able to continue providing these services and growing despite having different partners or different players in the community. Um, so we, we want to we definitely want other people to have access to this and uh, and we're, we're working on the publishing. Duly noted. Uh, the other thing is, um, and I, I know Bill's on the call, uh, Dr. Savapil's on the call, is that many of these patients are excellent candidates for the immediate postpartum LARC. And we are still doing that. I, got, I had a question uh, sent to me not long ago is it still safe to do that? The answer is yes. There's no reason why we cannot do the immediate postpartum LARC uh, during these um, challenging uh, times. And many of these patients are excellent candidates for that. I did speak with uh, uh, John Essenberg about what changes they've had to uh, make. And you mentioned uh, several of them, but one of the things he emphasized is that they certainly are doing more take-home doses in the appropriate patient uh, at this time? We, um, for our pregnant women and our, our general medication assisted treatment population, we are doing more uh, take home dosing or, or take home dosing for longer periods, but we have not wanted to um, decrease the number of contacts and how we continue to engage people. So um, we have virtual, instead of people coming into intensive outpatient, uh, groups. We have virtual groups that we're running, and uh, we went from running groups five days a week to running groups seven days a week because the patients asked to have groups on Saturday and Sunday. Um, we still have them come in at least once a week so that we can assess them and see how they're doing. So even though they have medication, maybe um, instead of uh, d depending on where they are in the program, before all of this happened, we would have people come in for daily dosing initially. Obviously, that's not the case now, but we're still working to make sure that we are assessing and that we're uh, continuing to engage as much as possible, even given the, the new circumstances. Um, I just wanted to know, like, how far out do you follow the mothers after they've given birth? Yeah. I know you had the statistics with up to 12 months. Um, like, when do you start to transition them to the community? Um, in terms of like maintaining their treatment, even after they've given birth. So we, when they give birth, they often will transition into a residential program and that residential program takes over their care completely. Um, we keep tabs through our communication with the residential program, but we're no longer the primary treatment provider. 
um, especially if they're not on medication assisted treatment. In the last year, uh, we had a change in our uh, treatment providers in Broward County and um, the provider that it's, it's a well care, uh, the Village South, that's now taken over this, the, the main partnership with us. They do medication assisted treatment in their residential setting. Um, so often what ha what'll happen is, is that, uh, you know, we, we know how the patient is doing based on them being on res in residential treatment. When they discharge from residential treatment, um, often, what we have been seeing is that they'll re-engage with us either for long-acting naltrexone, like Alberto discussed, um, or coming into MAT, or we do have a primary care clinic that is part of our behavioral health center. Because they have established ties to us, it's a, it's a great avenue for them to come in and just have ongoing preventive care once they give birth. Uh, I, hello, thank you. This is Bill Sappenfield. I'm the director of Fort Perry Claudia Collaborative, and I, I'm very impressed with what the Memorial Health System has been able to do. Uh, and and it is detoxification, but I must say it's it's detoxification plus the the system of care that you use, both behavioral health and support services for these um, families, is is a model for everyone even even the women you don't put in detoxifications get incredible uh services to help them through this time period and, and my my compliments to your your whole system and then listening to what you're doing with COVID 19 only makes it even more impressive um one of the questions that keeps running into and we keep running into is acogs guidelines for what what is acceptable and their biggest concern that they keep bringing up is recidivism, and I know that your program does fairly well with that. I think the debate is, what is the package with detoxification, and how do we have a package such that recidivism is not a problem? And I didn't know if you wanted to address that. I think that's a challenge that we've faced. Um, I mean, we're going back five years, and obviously we presented data from uh, other other providers, um, uh, from the mother study to Towers to Pell. So there a variety of individuals who have done quite a bit of positive impact um, in this population, specifically related to maintenance or detoxification. And really, we know that the cornerstone is uh, the comprehensive nature of the program. And we're aware of that. We're aware of uh, the need for it to be comprehensive. We are aware that there's a variety of individuals and programs uh, in the community that have to come together, really. That's the truth. Um, so I think that the challenge is is, is what to do with that uh, dynamic. I think that from my perspective, I mentioned earlier, access to care is extremely important. Engagement is extremely important. I think that the traditional of what we've done with methadone has its place. Um, however, I think it's missed the mark. And I think that it's missed the mark in lieu of what we saw happen in the last five years with the opioid epidemic explode with the fentanyl issues. And like I, now we're seeing a, a slight decrease, uh, obviously impacted from decreasing prescribing of opioids. But what's gonna happen in, in the future with fentanyl and uh, fentanyl analogs? What's gonna happen related to COVID now? Because now COVID is gonna change the dynamics of how we engage and interact with individuals and patients. Um, they're not gonna, if they weren't a priority before, it would potentially be a less of a priority. So to your point, obviously it's very challenging. I think that uh, the comprehensive nature of programs is crucial. I think at minimum, uh, identification, screening is crucial and then starting them on something and then finding out where we continue these individuals, meaning if it was methadone, it was nerfing, we have to have these systems in place to continue these individuals on these treatments. And hopefully if it's comprehensive enough and if they are the right candidate, then this is a, a, a good option. Detoxification has now shown to be safe and has been shown to be successful in decreasing mass rates. Uh, so it should be an option and the right candidate to your point.
Yeah, and, and to add to that, and I mean, that's excellent. Obviously, I agree. And I would also say that, you know, the research is pretty clear that it's not, we're all concerned about recidivism. We're all concerned about the mother relapsing when she's detoxed. But it's a fallacy to think that pregnant women who are on maintenance therapy don't relapse and don't engage in a lifestyle of drug use. So we've seen in the different studies where, you know, there, there's, uh, babies being born on methadomainus are still substance exposed to other opioids or other drugs. Um, we spent a, quite a bit of time talking about opioid use disorder, but I want to make it clear that our program was designed for all substance use. So we work with women regardless of whether they're using polysubstance, uh, benzodiazepines and an opioid, um, whether it's a stimulant. So we are, the idea is, is a real focus on recovery and then making sure that we're providing those social supports. So it isn't just about detoxing, it's about what else are you putting in place that's gonna promote recovery. And I, I think that having this, this care that's integrated, if we're working with an OBGYN and the OBGYN and the substance abuse provider are providing the same information and the same message and the sense that we're working together, I think that goes a long way. Um, once the woman is detoxed, it doesn't mean that she stops substance abuse treatment, but the behavioral components, the trauma therapy, all of that stuff continues. So, so having treatment that is, I think in some cases, the detoxification was done by the substance abuse treatment provider, and then that was that. Right, so you d detoxify them, but there's no other components to the treatment. And, and we know that for this patient population, especially, that care has to be comprehensive and then integrated, not just substance abuse treatment in and of itself is gonna make the difference that, that we, we can really make an impact on recidiv recidivism. Uh, yeah, again, I think that's great. Again, the reason I bring up recidivism, it is really important as a pediatrician, especially what happens to the family. So, but the other thing is, as people in Florida consider trying to model your program, my biggest concern is they can only go down that avenue if they can put together the same integrated comprehensive system that you have, that it's not just about detoxification in and of itself, but it's about the, the whole package, which I am afraid that many of the communities here in Florida are not able to uh, meet that. The other thing I did want to bring up is a point that Dr. Hill did about uh, immediate postpartum walk. We have been working with Medicaid and hospitals to try and get that up. Uh, it, it has been challenging because of billing issues. We do have one hospital that has now been successful. Tampa General has been able to offer immediate postpartum walk. That's by giving a long acting reversal contraceptive in the hospital at the time of delivery. Um, literature now shows it is by far the most cost-effective approach because about 70-something percent of women who after delivery want LARC never get it quite done. And by being in the hospital and having a pay source and a provider, it provides a great opportunity. They were able to get about eight of the plans to be able to reimburse them with about a 90% reimbursement rate. So we're, we're hoping that when COVID-19 is over and we can get hospitals attention again, that we can start encouraging other hospitals to offer this as an option to mothers there are many mothers who would benefit, including mothers who uh, have suffered with opioid use disorder. Again, thank you for the presentation. And again, I've always been very impressed with what you all are doing. I, I would uh, agree with Bill. And in fact, I would say that if the uh, institution or city or, or county clinic cannot do everything that you do in your program, then they should not be detoxification. Uh, using detoxification in the pregnant patient, because as you pointed out so nicely, it's not just the reduction in the amount of drug that they are taking, but it's that behavior part that is necessary. So we, if they can't do it all, then they should not be doing it at all. I said, I, abs I absolutely agree with uh, both points. And I think that uh, one of the things that uh, Claudia mentioned is that we hope to find partners uh, across Florida We've already identified somebody locally uh, that has a similar system to us that can implement similar programs and it could be comprehensive. If it's comprehensive to your points, hopefully we can have similar uh, outcomes in those areas as well. Well, let's, um, let's hope, you know, but just one more question then we'll move on to our, our guidelines. 
is there, uh, during you know in the environment that we are now what is um, does uh, is there a role for telehealth telepsychiatry telemedicine you know to sort of alleviate some of the uh, issue like you mentioned earlier that also that some physician in what country were no longer accepting women with um, the uh, substance abuse issue did I understand that right it was um, so the substance abuse providers, um, anybody that was providing face-to-face uh, -face or doing MAT inductions just for the general population, um, they stopped taking new patients. So in the second week of March, once we started putting in these new guidelines for the coronavirus, they just said, you know, blanketly, they didn't have um, the system in place to take new patients. And so they just stopped taking new patients. So uh, we've been, uh, we're the only program in Broward County where uh, a women uh, achieve or can enter treatment through the emergency department. Um, in general, that we use the same approach for medication assisted treatment for the general population and that hasn't stopped. So we continue to do what we were doing. Um, that's basically it. so in terms of telehealth um, one of the things that we were working on we, we were developing uh, this pilot program that could be used as a model in the state was how we can use uh, tele telemedicine for consultation or telemedicine for support of a program that was looking to put a collaborative such as this in place so what we found be because of uh, coronavirus is that it's really sped up the process in terms of doing um, telepsychiatry consultations of uh, visits with with the psychiatrist through telemedicine and then also the even the the psychotherapy uh, doing telemedicine with that so we great we were grateful or we were lucky that we had already started putting a lot of that in place before now. So we've just been able to uh, ramp it up and we continue to do so. Because right now we're waiting for a lot of the technology and our electronic health record system to catch up to what we're doing. Because I would think that, for example, you know, uh, the peer to peer uh, support could be very, done very well for telehealth. Yes, but for us, for example, we, we have Epic. So in order to use Epic, you need um, uh, cameras. We didn't have enough cameras and now there's like a shortage of cameras. So, so you know, there's been all of these things, but yeah, we have a group here in, uh, in Broward County, South Florida Wellness Network. They were an entire, they are an entire peer support network. So they work with, uh, they have peers that go into different emergency departments. They have peers that go out through throughout the community to try to engage people in treatment. They do classes and they've gone completely virtual. So everything that they're doing, including classes has been um, virtually. And they're able to do that because they're not part of an, like, so an EHR like us. Right. However, yeah. all of the HIPAA um, guidelines that we had before have been um, significantly uh, eased. And so we're able to use different technologies that we couldn't use before. That's excellent. Well, we will um, do our best to uh, to support and uh, promote your most excellent program. And if we can be of any help in um, facilitating or finding partners for you, we certainly will uh, will do so. But uh, that's excellent. Thank you so much.